بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Mu'adh ibn Jabal, may Allah be pleased with him, narrates that I was riding a donkey by the name of Ufayr behind the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, O oh Mu'adh, do you know what is Allah's right over his servants? I said, Allah and his messenger know best. The Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah's right upon his servants that they worship him without associating others with him. This is a well-known hadith and one of the greatest hadiths around because it gives us Allah's rights over us and this is the ultimate right parents have rights wives and spouses have rights children have rights neighbors have rights your own health and body has rights over you but nothing comes compared to Allah's rights over us because every breath we take is by his permission and if he stops it we die everything we have our knowledge our wealth our health our security our provisions we can go on forever just naming Allah's favors and blessings over us and it comes from Allah alone so if we do not give Allah his due right then we have a problem this hadith is one of the great hadiths because it includes numerous number of benefits yani for example the scholars when they interpret this hadith they give an example of Mu'adh saying, I was riding behind the Prophet ﷺ on a donkey named Ufayr. So, benefit number one, it is permissible to ride on a donkey. Not only that, it is permissible for two people to ride on a donkey if it is not harmful for the donkey. Which means that the donkey has the ability to take two riders number three calling a donkey giving him a name so if one gives a name to his car people would look in a strange way at him what are you, why are you calling your car nancy so why, why not so it is part of the sunnah to give things names even the children the prophet asam used to give them nickname Ya Aba Umair, Mada Fa'ala Nughair. His camel, Al Qaswa. His, so, his sword, Dhul Faqar. Everything has na had names. And this is to relate to the things you own and possess as if it's something personal. But this is not the time to elaborate more on this as the time is quite limited. So, what was the question? Do you know what is Allah's right over his servants? So the answer from the Prophet ﷺ was Allah's right upon his servants that they worship him. So number one, to worship Allah. And this is not enough. Number two, without associating others with him. Now, 
we have to understand this right because this makes it or breaks it. Our life on earth is limited. Generally speaking, between 60 and 70 years of age. And the Prophet said, rarely you will find someone exceeding that. So if you're fortunate to live to be 80 or even 90, then don't dream for something more to come because you are on borrowed time. So you must, first of all, see whether you have fulfilled Allah's rights over you or not. Now, to worship Allah and not to associate others with Him. This means that if you worship Allah Azza wa Jal, it is not sufficient because there are people who worship Allah and worship others with Him. And the definition of worship itself, people have great misconception in it. When you ask people, what do you understand of the word worship? They say salah, fasting, hajj. They refer to the pillars of Islam. But this is not true because then worshiping Allah would be limited to average of 15 minutes a day. And the rest of the day would be down the drain because there's no worship, worshiping of Allah Azza wa Jal. But this is not the case. The word worshiping in Arabic is ibadah. It comes from making the road, linguistically that is, making the road flat and easy for commuters and cars. In Arabic, we, ke we call the, the, the paving of the road is abad tariq So the road has been made flat and straight. And this is the linguistic origin of ibadah, is that you submit your will to Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is what Shaykh al-Islam identified ibadah to be. He said ibadah is a general terminology that incubates everything that Allah loves, whether out of sayings, rhetorics, or actions, whether they're hidden, like the actions of the heart or appearing like what we do. So by this terminology, ibadah is anything that Allah loves coming from his servant. Ibadah is an essential thing in our lives. Allah says, and we certainly sent into every nation a messenger saying, worship Allah and avoid the taghut. So this is the common message of all messengers that you should, you must worship Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is the essence why Allah created us. Do you think Allah created us to just live, eat, drink, sleep? Did Allah create us to get married and build a house and have a job? This is the reason that Allah created us? This is a byproduct. No one will say, Allah created me to worship Him. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to buy things. No, this is illogical. Allah created us to worship Him. It is our misunderstanding of the word worship that led us to where we are as Muslims nowadays. Allah says in the Quran, and I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me. So why did Allah create us to worship him? Does Allah need us? Of course not. Does Allah need our worship? Of course not. Allah Azza wa Jal on the seventh heaven above the Kaaba, there is a house called Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur. And in this Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur, every single day 70,000 angels enter it. 
never to come back to it until the day of judgment. So you do the math. Since Allah Azza wa created the heavens and the earth, how many angels entered it and how many angels does Allah have? The Prophet said, والسلام, there is no place in the heavens, in the seven skies of four fingers, except there is an angel either standing or bowing or prostrating to Allah Azza wa Jal. Does Allah need us? Of course not. Yet he created us to worship him. And this by itself is an honor. So how can we worship Allah Azza wa Jal to fulfill our rights to him? Well, worshiping Allah as you have heard is not limited in the pillars of Islam, though without the pillars of Islam, you're not a Muslim. So these are the foundations of a building. But if you don't have air conditioning, windows, doors, walls, this building is not livable. You cannot live in it. So you have to have it. So what do you mean by worship? Everything you do, if you have the good intention, this is worship. Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, say, Verily, my salat, my prayer, my sacrifice, my living, and my dying are for Allah, the Lord of the Alameen. E living and dying, everything in my life is for Allah Azza wa Jal. And the believer, when he has a good intention, everything he does, Allah would reward him for it and it would be considered to be a form of ibadah. If you go jogging, why are you jogging? To become fit. Okay, that's permissible, go ahead. Why are you jogging? To become a fit Muslim. So I'm healthier, I can pray taraweeh without getting tired, I can be ready whenever jihad is called to defend my religion and my country. I would, I would like to be a strong believer. Ah, no, this is ibadah. Your jogging is ibadah. Go ahead. What do you mean by ibadah? Meaning that the half hour you jog, Allah would reward you for it as if you're reading the Quran, making dhikr, making tasbih. Seriously? Yes. Why are you drinking shay halib? Why are you drinking tea? Because I, I love it. I, I, I'm, I'm used to it. Okay, that's permissible. No problem. And the other one says, well, actually, I, I'm drinking it because I have taraweeh. And this makes me awake and refreshes me so I can pray with enthusiasm. Drinking your tea, making your tea, serving your tea is ibadah. Ya Sheikh, we have to make a lot of changes in our lives if it's, this is the way. Not only that, those who are married, when they are intimate with their spouses, this is ibadah. The companions were shocked, said the Prophet of Allah. How is this possible? We, we get involved in intimacy and in fulfilling our desires and it's ibadah? He said, if you did it in haram, would you be sinful? He said, yes. And then if you do it in halal, you are rewarded. What kind of a religion is this? تَبَسُّمُكَ فِي وَجْهِ أَخِيكَ صَدَقَةً Smiling in the face of your brother is a charity. Of course, of the same gender, huh? You don't go out and look at the opposite gender and say, smile, this is sadaqa. No, this is smackable. You need to be smacked for this. This is sinful. No, for the same gender, I mean. So, the companions had this in them the urge to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. But sometimes because of their enthusiasm, they would divert a little bit. And they were the role model of this ummah. And that's why the Prophet Azza used to correct them. And by correcting them, he used to correct the ummah. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with him. A great companion. His father is Amr ibn al-As, one of the companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam got married two weeks later his father checks on his daughter-in-law how is abdullah she said he's the best of men he prays all night and he fasts all day 
Amr was smart. He immediately went and complained to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, I gave him one of the most noble, beautiful women of Quraysh. And look what he has done to her. She did not complain. But I understand, if he sleep, if he prays all night and fasts all day, when will he have time for hanky-panky? No time, which means that, sorry, we cannot uh, uh, attend your call. We're out of service temporarily. The Prophet summoned him and said, Abdullah, how, how, how many times do you read the Quran? What's, what's your way? He said, I finish the Quran once every night in night prayer. Meaning eight hours of tahajjud, he finishes the whole Quran from cover to cover every single night. And how do you fast? He said, I fast every single day. I don't miss a day. So all the year is Ramadan for him. So the Prophet told him, son, no, don't do this. Finish the Quran once every month. This is the minimum. He said, I can do more. Once every 20 days. He said, I can do more. Once every 10 days. Once every week. And then he stopped him at that. Likewise, with fasting, he kept on bargaining with the Prophet until the Prophet said, fast one day and skip one day. This is the fast of Dawood, the best fast ever. So the Prophet would used to correct whenever there's a diversion in their understanding of Ibadah. Three of the companions came and checked on his houses, asked their why asked his wives their mothers and they said how did the prophet how is the prophet's routine in his house so they told them that they do this he does that and they belittled it they said yeah of course the prophet allah has forgiven his previous sins and upcoming sins he's not like us i one of them said will pray all night long never sleep the second one said I personally will fast every single day, never break my fast. And the third one said, I will leave the desires of this life. I will never marry. The Prophet was outraged, alayhi salatu was salam. He went to the pulpit and he said, why do people say things I do not do? I pray and sleep. I fast and I break my fast and I marry women. Whoever chooses a, a way, a sunnah other than mine, then he's not from me. So the understanding of ibadah has to be aligned with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And by doing so, you understand that worshipping Allah must be according to Quran and to the sunnah with the balance needed. See, Islam does not focus on quantity. It focuses most on quality. You can finish the Quran once every night, but this does not add any value to you. If you read one page with understanding and pondering and implementing into, into yourself, this is much better and far greater than anything else. And if you worship Allah Azza wa Jal with this understanding, you will not look down at others. What do you mean? For example, tonight after Fatur, everybody is going to the masjid for Taraweeh. If I don't go and I say, I'm not coming tonight, how would you look at me? You will look down at me. You'll feel that this guy is not careful. He's not a good Muslim. I'm going to spend 30 minutes praying. Mashallah, they, they, in, in messages here in Kuwait, they spent 30 minutes praying night prayer, taraweeh. I prayed in a masjid one ayah per rak'ah a couple of days ago. One ayah? <laughs> what is this? this is, even my, my, my car is not as fast as this. One ayah in rak'ah, Allahu Akbar. In the second uh, rak'ah, one ayah. What is this? So you will look down at me and say, Sheikh is not doing good ibadah. He's not praying night prayer. Well, this is a big mistake, which shows that we do not understand what ibadah is. Now there are pillars, there are mandatory and obligatory acts of Islam that no one is excused in abandoning. But there are 
voluntary acts, voluntary forms of worship that no one has the right to object why you're not doing this. It's none of your business. And this is why at the time of Malik ibn Anas, the Imam of Medina, one of the four great Imams of the schools of thought, there was a man by the name of Abdul Aziz Al Umari, and he was known of being a monk like. And he worships Allah all night, he fasts, he's, he doesn't want the dunya, he doesn't want to work and earn money, he's happy with one day to day, that's, that's enough. So once he wrote a letter reprimanding Malik. And he's saying to him, Ya Malik, you are spending so much time in the masjid teaching people, giving lectures, doing this, compiling hadith, writing, and, and you have students. You didn't leave enough room for ibadah, for worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal, for night prayer, for fasting, voluntary fast, for doing this and that. So Malik ibn Anas, being the scholar he was, he wrote back to him, saying that may Allah accept your deeds. You're a great man of worship and you're a great man of God, but Allah Azza wa Jal has divided provisions to each and one of us. Do we have the same provision? We find people who are more educated than the others. We find people more healthier than the others. We find people more richer and people are poorer and people are more influential. Uh, uh, yeah, you have more influence. They have a better job, a bigger house, a smaller family. Uh, the, people are different. Who gave this to them? Allah. So Malik is saying to this Abdul Aziz Al Umari, and likewise in terms of worship, Allah opens the door for each and every one of us that suits him. So some people, Allah opens the door. I'm not talking about mandatory things. I'm talking about voluntary. Some people, Allah opens the door that they pray for three, four hours, Qiyamul Layl and Tahajjud, every single night. While others cannot. They try five minutes, they're dead sleep. Yet those who are dead sleep, they give in thousands in charity, in helping orphans, in building masjid, in da'wah, while that one of four hours of prayer cannot give one single dinar. It's difficult for him. A third one, Allah opens the door of teaching. And Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal was asked, which is best, to spend the night praying or to spend the night studying books of knowledge. He said, studying books of knowledge is better than praying because prayer is for myself, but studying is for the ummah. I'll teach and I'll preach and I'll guide people. So the benefit is transitive rather than being only for myself. So he said to Abd Aziz al Umari that you Allah has opened the door for you in this particular thing. But remember that Allah made Jannah with how many doors? How many gates? Well, I, I don't know. Now we have to wait and see. Huh? Eight. Eight gates for Jannah. And how many gates for hell? Seven. So Allah made eight gates for Jannah. We know that Rayyan is the gate for? Peace, people fasting, there is gate for jihad, there is gate for charity, there is gate for prayer, which means that Allah divided these forms of worship according to our needs. It is a blessing of Allah. Because if Allah said, no, you have to do this particular form of worship as voluntary, and I can't do it. Isn't there any alternative? No. A lot of people won't make it. But when Allah diversifies and tells you, no, you can do this. If you can't, you can do this. If you can't, you can do this. Then we have a lot of things that we would benefit from. So this is in short, to worship Allah. Allah's first half of Allah's rights over us. To worship Allah. The 
issue of worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal should be extended into much, much more, which includes the niyyah, which includes the types of worship, which is, includes the, the, the many different things, but we don't have time for that. Now, the best part, the best form of worship is what? Salat, okay. This is one answer. Any more? Zakat? Dhikr. This is, there's another hadith that says this. Yes, true. Hmm? Dua. Dua is ibadah. The Prophet says, alayhi salam. True. Charity. See, if I try to find a hadith for each one of them, I'll find. What does this mean? It means that the Prophet used to change alayhi salatu his answer according to the one who's asking. So a man comes, O Prophet of Allah, what is the best deed to Allah praying on time? He knows that he may be a little bit late for the first row. So he gives him what's good for him. Another man comes, O Prophet of Allah, advise me, do not become angry because he had seen him fight and he was agitated quickly. So the best thing for him is this. Another man comes, O oh, Prophet of Allah, tell me about the best. You have to be dutiful to your parents because his parents were complaining. So each one, these are all good deeds, but when push comes to shove and you want to really know what is the best form of worship available, then it is Tawheed. Oof. Tawheed? Yes, the Prophet والسلام, who sent Mu'adh himself, this, the same man, to Yemen, he told him that you will approach people of the book. The people of Yemen were Jews and Christians. So you will, he's, he's giving him heads up. He's giving him uh, uh, intel about the people he's going to give da'wah. And this is very important. When you want to give da'wah to people, you have to know their backgrounds. You can't go to, uh, uh, for example, give da'wah to Buddhists and you don't know anything about Buddhism. You can't go to Japan and you don't know anything about their religion, their religion the Chinto, I think it's called, or something like that, and how they pre perceive their emperor, the son, of, the son of the sun, or is the sun their go god. You have to have something. So the Prophet is giving him intel, alayhi salatu You will be coming to people of the book and let it be the first thing you call them to at tawheed the word in arabic he said an yuwahidullah that they believe in the oneness of allah azza wa jal now tawheed is not only that tawheed is divided into three main categories if you do not fulfill them all to worship Allah and not to associate others with Him. You will fail in this part. Because worshiping Allah, we know now. We have a good niyyah. After a while, we'll have iftar. So I'll try my level best with my niyyah. I have, don't have to say to help my brother next to me. So I give him my food, hoping that he accepts it and I'm giving iftar to a fasting person, I will get his reward. I'll try to help in cleaning up. I'll try to help in moving the chairs because this is part of da'wah. This niya makes or breaks. It changes everything you do. So this is worshiping Allah Azza wa Now we would like to know what, uh, uh, what uh, um, shirk is, what associating others with Allah is so that we can avoid it. The scholars say that Tawheed is divided into three types. You all know this by default, inshallah. But it's a reminder that it helps. The first one is called Tawheed al It comes from Ar-Rabb. And Ar-Rabb is one of Allah's names. The owner, the founder, the master, all of these are incorporated in the word Ar-Rabb. And 
they translate it into Tawheed of Lordship. The Lordship of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it is two types. General, this is for the Kafir, for the animals, for the whole world. And specific, special. This is only for the believers. When you want Allah not to leave any gaps between you and Him, no obstacles. When you want Allah to facilitate your affairs, you always say, Rabb. And this is why everywhere in the Quran, you will find Allah Azza wa Jal's mentioning that His messengers would say, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi. They call Allah by Rabbi, not Ilahi or Allah. They always use Rabb because this is specific, special for the believers to ask Allah Azza wa Jal to facilitate their, their affairs. So, if you want to describe or to define the Tawheed of Lordship, some say that it is worshipping Allah with His actions. And this is not accurate, technically speaking, because there are actions of Allah that do not relate to us. They are intransitive, such as speaking, such as uh, uh, becoming uh, pleased or becoming angry, such as descending to the lower heaven, such as being uh, over and upon the throne. All of these are intransitive. They have nothing to do with us. So we don't worship Allah by them because we believe in them. That's it. But there are actions of Allah that relate to us, such as, to believe that Allah is the owner of everything. This is part of Tawheed al rububiyyah that Allah is the owner. Allah is the creator of everything. So who created shaitan? Allah Azza wa Jal. Who created our deeds and actions? Allah Azza wa Jal. Whether good or bad, even when someone does something bad, he did not create his own deeds. Allah created it for a reason. So it's important to know that Allah is the creator of everything and no other creator exists. You have to believe that Allah is the giver of life and the taker of life. So he is the one who gives life and he is the one who gives death as well. You have to believe that Allah only is the provider Ar-Razzaq, anything that we have, no one has a hand in it. It's all from Allah Azza wa Jal. You have to believe that Allah facilitates our affairs. Whatever happens is by Allah Azza wa Jal. This was found in one ayah. Beautiful ayah in Surah Yunus. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Say, who provides, see, providing, yeah? Who provides for you from the sky and from the earth? Or who owns hearing and sight? And who brings out the living from the dead and brings out the dead from the living? And who disposes the affairs? They will say, Allah, say, will you not then be afraid of Allah's punishment? The disbelievers, the idol worshippers, believed in a rububiya. Anyone who worship idols, ask him, who's bringing the rain down? They'll say Allah. No one would say Jesus. No one, say, was, no one would say Buddha. No one would say our cow. They all believe that Allah Azza wa is the who makes life and who takes it. They would say Allah. So, generally speaking, we don't have beef with the majority of people when it comes to Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. The vast majority know Tawheed al-Rububiyyah by nature. Even the atheists. Where is God? They said, there's no God. If you were with them in a boat or in an airplane and it's about to crash, the first thing they would say, Ya Allah, their hearts will be directed straight to the heavens. They don't believe that Allah is everywhere. By nature, they just go, Ya Allah. The one in 
the heavens, the one over everything subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one in the height. So this is natural, rububiyyah, lordship is natural. We all believe in that. So we will not take time. Move on to number two, which is Tawheedul Uluhiyya. Al Uluhiyya. This is Tawheed of worship. The first one was Rububiyya. In English, Lordship. This one is Worship. So, what is Tawheed Al Uluhiyya? Tawheed al uluhiyya basically is to worship Allah Azza wa Jal with our own deeds. So lordship, rububiyya, it's worshiping Allah by his deeds. Uluhiyya is worshiping Allah by our deeds. And Allah says in the Quran, and your Lord has decreed that you not worship except him. This is Final. You cannot worship anyone other than him. And this means that all types of worship must be directed and devoted solely 100% to Allah without associating others with him. This type of Tawheed is the type that Allah sent all the messengers with. And this is where the dispute between the messengers and their enemies took place. When the Prophet came والسلام, to the idol worshippers and he told them, worship Allah. They said, make all our forms of worship only to one God. You made all these gods 360 around the Kaaba. Every day we have one God. You want us to just simply throw them away? This is, this is not possible. Then why do you worship idols? So yeah, yeah, we know that Allah is one, but we worship the idols so that they get us closer to Allah. So we prostrate to them, we pray to them, we sacrifice to them, and this is shirk. Without any doubt, Allah Azza wa Jal says, and we did not send any messenger before you, Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, but we inspired him saying, La ilaha illa ana. None has the right to be worshipped but I, so worship me. So this form of Tawheed is the biggest problem nowadays in the world, especially in the Muslim world. And this is why people differ. This is why people fight. This is why people start pointing at each other because of the error in this form of Tawheed. Why? We Muslims believe that we can only worship Allah. True? True. Part of the worship is prostration, sacrifice, as the ayah I have mentioned earlier. If you go to other countries, though they claim to be Muslims, you will find that they breach their Islam by slaughtering to dargahs, to graves, to peers. They believe that this dead person can re can relieve me from my calamity. And this is why they say, Ya Badawi. Where is Al-Badawi? Who are you calling? I'm calling Al-Jilani. I'm calling Al-Tijani. I'm calling Abdul Qadir. I'm calling Al-Hasan. I'm calling al Hussein. I am calling the Prophet himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, relieve me from my calamity. The brother just said, a dua is ibadah. You're making dua to whom? To someone who's dead. Then how is this possible? This is shirk. This takes a person out of the fold of Islam. When a person acknowledges that Allah only knows the unseen, knows the ghayb, but he goes to a peer or to a soothsayer or to a sorcerer asking him to change his situation, to tell him the forecast, a fortune teller, what is my future? Where is my car that was stolen? How do I do this? This is a kafir. He associated others with Allah. 
he did not fulfill the rights of Allah, then we have a big problem in this. We will come to some examples later on if the time permits, insha'Allah. Now, the third type of tawheed, so we, first type was rububiyyah, lordship. Second type, uluhiyyah, worship. Third type is the beautiful names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Beautiful, beautiful form of Tawheed. But why do we mention it? Because there are people who breached it and went out of the fold of Islam when they had a lot of errors in it. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, there is nothing like unto him and he is the hearing and seeing. What is this? There is nothing. This is negation. But then he approves and affirms that is all hearing, all seeing. How can we understand this? The scholars say to understand and believe in Tawheed al-Asma wa sifat is to negate everything that crosses your mind about Allah Azza wa Jal and only affirms what Allah described himself by in the Quran or the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu described Allah by in the Sunnah. That's it. There's no third source. In beautiful names and attributes of Allah, you cannot learn them from scholars. You cannot learn them from companions. It has to be either from Quran or from authentic Sunnah. So how do we understand this? Well, you have to believe in the beautiful names and attributes without distortion. What do you mean by distortion? Distortion is to change the meaning. So, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa, they distorted it, the people of innovation, and said istawla. They added a letter to change the meaning in the Quran. They said, no, no, the, the meaning is like this. This is distortion. Quran is in Arabic. So when you come, then you have to understand it like the Arabs understand it, not because of a translator or what you think. This is what Allah addressed the Arabs and this is what the Arabs understand. You have to believe in Allah's beautiful names and attributes without any misinterpretation. Allah Azza wa tells us in the Quran that he has hands. And specifically, he has two hands. It's in the Quran. Allah is telling Shaytan, Iblis, why did you not prostrate to what I have created with my two hands? This is what says in Arabic. So people say, yeah, 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 we believe in the Quran, but hands does not mean hands. Okay, what does it mean? It means power. So when I say I have a hand over this area, I have a grip over this area, means I have power. This is not Arabic. Where are you bringing this from? And even logically, it's unaccepted because what you say might be true in Arabic if you use one singular hand not two hands. Secondly, if it meant power, then the Satan would have responded when Allah said, I created Adam with my power. He would said, okay, you created me with your power as well. Who created me? So if it was not the actual hands of Allah, then Iblis would have objected and said, I was created also by your power. Allah Azza wa Jal created with his hands a number of things. Scholars say one was the pen that wrote our predestiny. Secondly, it was Adam. Thirdly, the tablets of Moses that were written and given to him. Fourthly, the palm trees that are planted in Jannah. These are some of the things that are backed by authentic hadith. So we believe in that, but um, the, the point is, there are people who distort things and they say, no, no, they're not as you understand it. 
uh, you have to believe in the beautiful names and, and, and attributes without denying the reality. Like the Jahmiyyah. They say Allah Sami'un Basir, but He does not see and He does not hear. How is that? So they affirm the name and they deny the attribute. And also, we do not ask how. So when you hear that Allah Azza wa Jal descends to the lower heaven when it is the last third of the night, you don't say, how does he descend? When Allah comes on the day of judgment, you don't say, how does Allah come? How does Allah hear every single sound with different languages in different areas and understand everything? You do not ask how, because you cannot comprehend this. And Allah is unlike anything that crosses your mind. So you have to believe in it as it is. Now, the biggest problem is, and I'll try to wrap up things. How much time we have for Fatur? 15 minutes. Yeah, inshallah, we will have, yani, wrap it up a little bit quickly. The biggest problem now, after you ha heard this, very brief introduction of Tawheed that it is just to give you a glimpse of how important it is. More important than your prayer, more important than your fasting, more important than your Hajj, because this is the foundation where everything else comes out. If you do not have the proper Tawheed, all of your Ibadah will be in vain. Allah says in the Quran, and most of them believe not in Allah except while they associate others with Him. In Arabic, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ The vast majority of Muslims nowadays do not believe in Allah Azza wa Jal except by associating others with Him. This is a problem. And this is why when you go back home, they point at you and say you're Wahhabi. What did I do? What did I say? Nothing but because you have the concept of Tawheed. When they tell you, you have to go to our Mawlana. So he would ask you questions and then he will tell you what happens and what will happen and what had happened. And you say, no, this is shirk. They said, you're a Wahhabi. If, you, if they tell you we have to go every Eid to the Dargahs, to the, uh, the graves and, and, and so on, and this is celebration, we don't worship anyone, but we have to bow, we have to do this. This is shirk, I can't do this. If they tell you you have to wear ta'viza, something that protects you from evil eye, I believe that Allah protects. This is haram, shirk. And you go on and on and on and on, and people don't accept this. Why? Because they don't have knowledge. Why? Because most of them believe not in Allah except while they associate others with Him. Shirk is one is the greatest, most dangerous thing a Muslim could face. Not only a Muslim, even the Prophet ﷺ. Allah says in the Quran, and it was already revealed to you, Muhammad, and to those before you, the messengers, that if you should associate anything with Allah, your work would surely become worthless and you would surely be among the losers. This is a threat to whom? To Prophet Muhammad To highlight the danger of shirk that everyone is taking for granted. People think that this is no problem. So you can pray, you can fast, you can perform hundreds of hajj, you can live for hundreds of years, but if you associate others with Allah, you will be eternally in hell. A'udhu Billah, may Allah protect us. This is, this is something serious. Allah does not forgive shirk at all. Allah says, indeed, Allah does not forgive association with him, but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills. So shirk is something you do not feel shy in objecting to, in rejecting, in refusing. You don't say, well, everybody is, is doing it, so I have to do it. No, you have to stand up and draw the line. And if you look at Islam, you will find that it had protected the Muslims for any 
similarity with the mushriks from getting close to them from any act that can be ambiguous yeah i'll give you examples talking about these examples would take us a lot of time but inshallah you have a glimpse of it what is the ruling on swearing by other than allah if i say by prophet muhammad i will not do this what's the ruling shirk it is totally prohibited to swear by anything other than Allah, even by Muhammad What about by the Kaaba? Kaaba is sacred, not even by the Kaaba. Only names of Allah and attributes of Allah. This is the only thing possible. Other than that, it is shirk. The Prophet said whoever swears by anything other than Allah, this is shirk. Also, what is the ruling on praying in the graveyard? Praying Dhuhr, praying Asr. Totally prohibited and unaccepted. Why? Because it, it has bowing and prostration and these are dead. Okay, but I'm praying for Allah. Even that. Because it might insinuate to someone that he's praying to the, 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 the dead. This is haram. Your prayer in the graveyard is not accepted. Except funeral prayer. Because funeral prayer does not have any bowing, no prostration. It's just Allahu Akbar four times. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. It's finished. This is halal. This is okay. Other than that, nothing is, is, is permissible. What's the ruling on praying while the sun is rising or setting? It's haram. This is time of prohibition. Because this is the time when the idol worshippers worship the sun. So the Prophet told us, don't do this because then you will look like them and people will think that you are like them. What is the ruling to in prostrating to other than Allah? Some elders, some kings, some tribesmen. This is in their culture. They prostrate. Haram. What the Japanese do to one another? Konijwa. Prohibited because it, in, it involves bowing and bowing is a form of worship only possible to Allah Azza wa Jal. Even drawing portraits. If I'm a, an artist and I'd like to draw a portrait of you, this is haram because I am imitating Allah's creation and this leads to shirk. And this is why we don't have statues. Why do Muslims don't have statues? Because the angels would not enter your house. Sheikh, I have a small camel I bought from Egypt. Haram. Angels won't enter your house. Sheikh, I have an elephant from Kenya. It will not enter your house. Sheikh, I have my father's portrait. May Allah have mercy on him. The angels will not enter your house. This is form that gets you close to shirk. And this is where all shirk started. Waddan wa sawa'an wa yaghutha wa yaquqa wa yasra. This is the five idols, good men of Nuh, way back, huh? Nuh people. When they died, shaitan came to them and said, build five statues on their graves so that whenever you see them, you start to worship Allah well. One generation is gone, the second generation came. Why do we have these statues? Hmm, because they make things happen. They are our gods, we will worship them. This is why statues in our religion is haram. The ruling of associating the Prophet ﷺ with Allah is prohibited. Allah protects Tawheed. So you cannot say, Ma sha Allah wa Muhammad. A man came to the Prophet said, Whatever you wish and Allah. He said, A'udhu Billah. Are you making me similar to Allah? Say whatever Allah wishes alone. Don't put me in, and now you go to many masjids. Let me check first of all. Yeah, this is, this is clear. You have masjids having Allah, Muhammad, next to each other. What is this? He said, oh, you don't like Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam alayhi. Do we spend our lives teaching Quran and Sunnah, following the Sunnah of the Prophet sallam, bearing whatever harm that comes our way? if we did not love the Prophet ﷺ, but having Muhammad, Allah, next to one another like this, anyone would come and say, Muhammad is Allah. Allah is Muhammad, or at least similar to Muhammad, or at least Muhammad is Hazir Nazir, and he controls the world as it's in the palm of his hand, and he knows the unseen, and he, A'udhu Billah, this is shirk, akhi, what are you doing? 
But people don't understand, they don't want to understand. They lock their brains and say, we, fo we follow our forefathers even to hell. We do not want to follow Quran and Sunnah. Akhi, I'm not bringing you a new religion. Open the Quran and read it. Open the Sunnah and you'll find everything that I'm talking about there. But if you insist on your arrogance, then I have nothing to do uh, uh, for you. Now, a lot of the people worldwide try to belittle Tawheed. So whenever you say Aqeedah, Tawheed, nah, 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 nah. This, this divides the Ummah. Let us focus on liberating Palestine. Okay, what does Palestine have to do with this? Palestine is always in our minds, but Tawheed is the only thing that saves me. With all due respect, the hell with the whole world. All what I care about is who? My salvation. If all the world goes to Jannah and I go to hell, am I a winner? No. But if everyone goes anywhere else, but I go to Jannah, I am a winner. This is what Allah would hold me accountable by. Did you go to Jannah or go to Nar to hell? Therefore, a lot of the people try to belittle Tawheed and say, no, 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 this divides the Ummah, this does this, this does that. And these are the enemies of the Ummah. Tawheed is the most important thing. With shirk, it spoils your intellect. It spoils your morality. It spoils your heart. And look at Yusuf. With Tawheed, he was seduced and tempted, but stayed steadfast. And look at the wife of Al-Aziz. Without Tawheed, she lost all of her chastity, all of her dignity. She plotted to do heinous things and when he refused, she put him in jail. What kind of a person is this? Tawheed purifies your soul and your heart. And finally, a lot of the time the brothers ask me, what maslak do you follow? What school of thought do you follow? And I say, why is it important? So no, we have to know. And other times they come and move to step two, which is if you're Hanafi, Shafi'i, Malki, Hanbali, then you are doomed in hell because you have divided the Ummah. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the Jews have divided into 71 sects, all of them are in hell. And the Christians have divided into 72 sects, all in hell. And the Muslims, my Ummah, will be divided into 73 sects, all in hell except one. So the Prophet, the companion said, which one? He said, whoever follows my footsteps and the footsteps of the companions. May Allah make me and you among them. So now the one million dollar, no, the one million Kuwaiti dinar question. It's more lucrative to have it in Kuwaiti dinar. Uh, the question is, who is among these 72 sects in hell? Hanafi, Shafi'i, Malki, Hanbali? No. These are differences in fiqh. Whether to put your hand under your belly or on your chest or you don't put your hands at all, your prayer is valid. These are differences of opinion in issues of fiqh, whether touching the opposite gender nullifies your wudu or not. This is not to do with aqeedah. What does have to do with aqeedah is tawheed. So the 72 sects are all have problems with tawheed, with aqeedah, with the belief of Allah Azza wa Jal, because the pillars of Iman are six. And they have a breach of one of these, believing in Allah, the day of judgment, the books, the messengers, in the angels and in the predestiny. If I had time, I would have given you a full workshop on how they have been divided into this. But it is related not to fiqh, not to your maslak. It is related to your aqeedah. Work hard on learning the aqeedah of the Prophet والسلام, of Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, the Aqeedah of Tawheed, and you will be insha'Allah with the Prophet on the Day of Judgment. I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that he purifies our hearts from any kind of shirk. 
and that Allah Azza wa grant us the proper way of worshiping him and that he makes us worship him until he is pleased with us. I say what you hear and I seek Allah's forgiveness. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een.